Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar. Dr. Claire and I are really delighted that so many of you are joining us for a conversation on HRT, that's hormone replacement therapy. I'm Helen Normoy, I'm co-founder of My Menopause Center, and there is no better person than my friend and co-founder, Dr. Claire, to have this conversation with. Dr. Claire is a real expert in this area. She qualified from Cambridge University and holds membership of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and membership of the Royal College of General Practitioners. She is also a member of the British Menopause Society, Medical Advisory Committee and a BMS menopause trainer. October is Menopause Awareness Month, as many of you may know, and the theme for this year's campaign is HRT. Mm -hmm. And while for many women, it's the most effective way of managing menopause symptoms while transforming how we feel, it's not for everyone. There can be medical reasons why some women can't take it. Some women don't tolerate HRT and others just don't want to take it. There is sometimes confusion about what HRT is, how it works and the dosage and options available. It's so important that you understand this so that you can make an informed decision about what is right for you. And that's why we're hosting two events this month where we're going back to basics on HRT. Today, we'll start off by looking at the two HRT hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Dr. Claire and I will discuss a range of topics, including what each is and why we need it, the different forms that each comes in, and Claire has a little box of tricks with her this evening to show us and to demonstrate, different ways to apply and take them, including the importance of correct application and the real difference that this can make, the benefits, risks, and side effects, dosage and other practicalities. Now, in a couple of weeks, we'll hold a second webinar for part two of this conversation, where we'll do a deep dive on testosterone and vaginal estrogens. And we know a lot of you have questions about prescribable alternatives to HRT or indeed herbal alternatives. And we have a, a webinar lined up for that in November and we'll share details soon. Now, as ever, your questions are very much welcome. Please do pop them in the chat and we'll cover as many as you can. But please also remember, we're not permitted to provide any personal medical advice within this session. We can, of course, comment on general questions. And remember, you should always talk to your medical professional before acting on any information provided. The webinar is being recorded. It'll be shared on the Restless platform, and we'll share it in our My Menopause Centre website and newsletter later on this week and early next. Now, our lovely My Menopause Centre colleague, Emma, is in the waiting room in the room too, and Emma will post links to any relevant content on our website. So with that, let's kick off. Dr. Claire, we'll start with our first question. If we just went back to basics, it would be super helpful if you could explain the role of estrogen and progesterone as part of a H or T regime, starting with why do we or do we always need both? Yes. Hi, everybody. It's really great to be talking to you this evening. Um, so HRT stands for hormone replacement therapy. And what we're aiming to do is just fill in some of the deep troughs of estrogen in the perimenopause and just lift the, your baseline estrogen a little higher in the postmenopause. Um, we're not aiming to sort of flood your system with estrogen. So estrogen is the hormone made by our ovaries that we lose in the menopause transition. And so it's estrogen, the fluctuation and loss of estrogen that's responsible for most of the symptoms we get in the menopause and also the long-term health consequences of the menopause. So namely osteoporosis and heart disease. So the mainstay of HRT is replacing some estrogen. The issue with estrogen is that it can thicken the womb lining if you haven't had a hysterectomy. And so it's really important that we take another hormone that is also made by our ovaries called the progestogen. And the progestogen is taken basically to stop the womb lining from over thickening. And it's really important that that dose is proportional to the dose of estrogen that you're taking. So which is why if you're on a higher dose of estrogen, what we're increasingly doing now is giving a slightly higher dose of progesterone. Progesterone can, some women like taking progesterone. For some women, it can also help um, sleep, for example. And for some, it can help anxiety. 
There are many women who may get side effects to progesterone. Progesterone can contribute to bone density, but the mainstay is the estrogen. So if you've had a hysterectomy, you only need the estrogen. You don't need the progesterone. There are a couple of, um, of um, special cases. Um, so if you've had a subtotal hysterectomy, you've left your cervix. If you've had a hysterectomy for endometriosis and they know or they suspect there's some endometriosis left behind, then you may be advised to add a progestogen as well. But for most women who've had a hysterectomy, they only need the estrogen. If we haven't had a hysterectomy, we need estrogen and progestogen. So that's the lowdown on what you need and why. And that's really important, isn't it, to have both, on, on, uh, except in the circumstances that you uh, that you outlined. Now, Claire, when we talk about estrogen and progesterone, we hear terms like synthetic, body identical and bioidentical. Mm -hmm. It would be really helpful, I think, if we could explain to everyone what the difference in each of those is and why it's important. Yes, no, no. So the terms are sort of used interchangeably. So what you really need to know is most of the estrogen that we prescribe in HRT is body identical. And sometimes that term is used um, interchangeably with bioidentical. And, and basically our ovaries make a number of different types of estrogen. And the most potent one, the strongest one is called estradiol, um, which you might see on the box of your HRT. And so estradiol is the same biochemically as our own estradiol. Um, a number of years ago, it was quite common to prescribe Premarin, or pre in, which was in Premic or Prempac C. And Premarin is derived from horse urine. Um, so it contains many, many different types of estrogen in a mix. And that's not body identical to us. And some of the estrogens in the combined oral contraceptive pill, again, aren't um, body identical. Most contraceptive pills contain ethanol estradiol, which is synthetic. And then in terms of progestogens, so we use the term progestogen to include all hormones or chemicals with progesterone-like action, and the hormone itself is called progesterone. So that's why you'll see it's a bit confusing, progesterone and progestogen. But progesterone is body identical um, and this is in the eutrogestin or Gepritix um, capsules, or it comes mixed up with estrogen in one Bijuve tablet or capsule. All of the other progestogens are actually synthetic, so they're not the same as our own progestogen, um, but they are very effective at keeping the womb lining thin. And so in terms to answer, why is this important? So we know that particularly the body identical progesterone may have a marginally lower risk of breast cancer associated with it. And there are some other benefits. It doesn't affect your blood clotting or your cholesterol, which some of the older progestogens may marginally affect by a tiny amount. But it's all a bit of a balance because the older progestogens are more, often more effective at keeping the womb lining thin. So it, it's why menopause management is not one size fits all and why it's really important to discuss what's best for you. Um, the final thing to say is you'll often see maybe adverts online for bioidentical hormones that are advertised as being matched to what you need through blood tests, but these are not evidence-based. Blood tests literally change day to day in the perimenopause, in the postmenopause, your estrogen will just be very low. Um, and they are made up in non-regulated pharmacies, they cost a lot of money, and they are often called bioidentical <laughs> hormones also. So it's really confusing. Basically everything you get from a regulated doctor Everything you get from my menopause center is regulated body identical hormone types, if that's what is right for you. Helen, that was yeah. a long answer. Does that make no, sense? But it was really good, Claire. It was really clear. And it's important to make that distinction, um, I think, particularly between synthetic and um, uh, body or bioidentical, but also, as you've been talking about, the specially formulated or compounded the HRTs that are mm. available, which are very expensive, and then you have to add in the cost of blood tests on top. 
but not recommended by NICE and not available in the NHS. We don't prescribe mm. them um, at, uh, at my menopause center as well. Now we're getting lots of fantastic questions coming in. I think quite a few of them will fit really nicely into this uh, section that we've got coming up shortly on benefits, risks, and side effects of HRT. So we're not forgetting those questions. We're definitely going to come back to them. But before we do, Claire, while we're on the kind of basics of HRT, are there particular conditions um, or particular family histories that would mean I shouldn't take HRT or I can't take HRT? Yeah, no, no. So that's a really good question. So actually, the contraindications to HRT are really few. So if you've had a hormonal depend a hormonally dependent type of cancer, like for example, breast cancer, then it's not recommended except in special circumstances that you take HRT because all the evidence points to an increased risk of recurrence of that cancer. Um, sometimes there's a quality of life discuss discussion to be had. Sometimes it's not a hard no. Um, you can't take HRT in pregnancy. You can't take HRT if you have really severe active liver disease, for example, um, cirrhosis of the liver, and that's because the hormones are processed through the liver. Um, if you've had, if you have unscheduled abnormal bleeding um, that's being investigated, if you are known to have endometrial hyperplasia where the womb lining is abnormally thickened and it hasn't been treated cancer of the womb lining that's not being treated, you can't take it. But a lot of the time, what the issue is, is we don't have a lot of evidence for safety. So you may want to take HRT for quality of life. And it's just really important then to have a discussion with a specialist about the risks and benefits and how that applies to you with your particular medical condition. So very few cases where you actually absolutely can't take HRT, they're usually cancer related. In terms of family history, um, you may have a family history of breast cancer, which means that your risk of breast cancer is raised above baseline. Again, it doesn't mean that you absolutely can't take HRT, but again, it means that it's really important that you have a discussion about the risks and benefits of HRT and how they apply to you and how they may affect your own risk of breast cancer. So it's it, it, it's so individualized. It, it's just so important to talk about HRT in the context of your history. It's why we have nice long appointments so you can yeah. do that, yeah. Yeah, no, look, Claire, that's really clear. There's one question, though, that I think is very pertinent to this section, which I'm just going to draw it in now, Claire, and then we'll move on um, to looking at the benefits of um, HRT. So we've had a question here from someone um, asking, I think you've clarified this, but I think it's an important question and it's worth re-clarifying, Claire. Uh, this lady is asking if she should stop taking progesterone when she's not had a period for 12 months and then just continue with the estrogel. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking it. So while ever you take any estrogen, it's really important you take the progestogen because I can't stress enough, if you take the estrogen by itself, it significantly increases your risk of cancer of the womb lining because the estrogen stimulates the womb lining to thicken. So often when women are taking eutrogestin, um, sometimes they may find it a fiddle to remember to take. Um, sometimes they may take less than the dose that's been recommended by the doctor, sometimes because it hasn't been fully explained in a, in a shorter appointment. But it's just really important you take the dose that's been prescribed for you and you always take it while ever you're taking an oestrogen. Thank you, Claire. That's really, really clear. And then last one linked to this, and it's an excellent question. Do you need to take the progesterone tablets if you have a Mirena coil? Oh, no. Brilliant question. Yes. No. The Mirena coil is um, contains progesterone. The little T-shaped bit of plastic contains a synthetic progesterone called levonorgestrel. You hardly absorb any of it into your system. You do absorb a tiny bit, but not very much at all. And it's the most effective way of keeping the womb lining thin for five years. And then you just have your estrogen alongside it. 
and if sometimes women have had this fit for contraception because it's also contraceptive and they've been told that they can keep it for eight years or if you've been it's been fit over the age of 45 you maybe have been told you can keep it until you're through the menopause age 55 and that's all true if you're using it for contraception only. If you're using it to protect the womb lining, then you keep it for five years, then just pop along, have it changed, have another one, and bob to your uncle. There, don't need to remember to take anything. Don't suit everybody. You know, having it fit is not a great five minutes, but once it's in, it's in. And if it suits you, it's really brilliant. It's the most effective way of keeping the womb lining thin. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Claire. And it's great to see it visualized there. Um, so turning our attention now that we've kind of covered the, the foundation information about HRT, why we need to take estrogen and progesterone. Um, if you step back and look in the round, Claire, as, a, you know, as an expert in this area, and you've treated thousands of patients, what are overall, how would you describe the benefits of taking HRT? And what symptoms can it help with? If we start off with that, and then there's lots more that we're going to delve into. Yeah, yeah. so HRT for most women will be the most effective way of managing menopause symptoms. Name, but when we look at that, most of the studies have been around hot flushes and night sweats. But HRT can help manage the psychological symptoms of the menopause. It doesn't always make all of the psychological symptoms go away completely, but can definitely take the edge off enough so you can crack on and look to other ways of managing them as well. It can really benefit the physical symptoms of the menopause. So if you've got aches and pains related to the menopause, for example, bladder symptoms related to the menopause, um, then it can help manage uh, many physical symptoms. Um, we've spoken about vasomotor symptoms, vaginal symptoms, we'll touch on um, at, uh, and the, at our later event, but it's very effective at managing vaginal symptoms, may help libido depending on why your libido and sexual desire is low, and may help cognitive symptoms as well. Again, the evidence isn't great in terms of HRT just eradicating all cognitive symptoms. So it may not make your memory as sharp as it was when you were in your early 30s, for example, but can certainly help go somewhere to managing it. And if you think about many symptoms of the menopause are interrelated. So we know, for example, that poor sleep, we know anxiety, we know hot flushes and night sweats can all impact on memory if we can help manage the hot flushes and night sweats, then we may be able to help cognitive symptoms as well. So it's going to be different for every single woman, but generally on the whole, HRT is not a magic bullet, but it is an effective way of seeing you through that transition, stormy transition of the menopause. Yeah, and look, we've had some comments here and, you know, a, a big comment here that I can personally relate to as well from a lady who's saying HRT has really helped her memory loss and brain fog um, at, right. at work. And uh, I, I think Emma has posted a link, but um, we have a symptom checker on the website that looks at 40 different symptoms of, of, um, of menopause. And everything on it is evidence-based, written by Dr. Clare, but it covers what causes the symptom and the range of ways to manage that symptom. And HRT, as Clare said, uh, is very often helpful, but things like lifestyle, nutrition, and so on are, play a really important role as well. We're not focused on them tonight, but that's not because they aren't important. They're hugely important. It's just yeah. that there's so much to cover around um, around HRT. So Claire, we, we often get the question, and I've seen it pop up in the chat tonight, when should we start taking HRT and for how long should we take it? Yeah, so really, I would say start HRT when you feel that you need something to help manage your symptoms. Basically, there's no right or wrong. It's going to be, as we've said several times already, it's going to be different for everybody. Some women wait, some women don't wait. Um, starting HRT early in the perimenopause can be helpful, but we don't have a lot of data about um, how the risks apply to women starting HRT early in the perimenopause. Um, generally, the dose would be lower the earlier you start it, and then you can increase it as you go along. Um, 
so I would say it's a personal decision when to start HRT. And then in terms of how long you're going to take it for, really, again, it's so up to you. It, it's really important that you take it for the right length of time for you and how to decide. So we know the risk of breast cancer is related to how long you take HRT for. That will be important to some women at higher risk, less important to other women at lower risk. I often say to women, just get to a time when you're feeling good, when you're feeling happy and try and reduce, start reducing the dose um, if you want to. You don't have to, you shouldn't feel pressure to. Um, and then if you feel fine, you might want to come off HRT. Actually, you might want to carry on because it's helping protect your bones and it's helping to protect your heart. So I think it's going to be different for every single woman, but it's why it's so important you have that review with your doctor. Certainly, I would say that there is no arbitrary limit to how long you can take it for, as long as you understand the risks and benefits and how they apply to you. The one exception to that is the if you go through the menopause under the age of 40, and probably if you go through the menopause under the age of 45, it's really important you get on HRT as soon as that early or premature menopause is diagnosed, maybe a surgical menopause, it may be a natural menopause, and you stay on it at least until the age of 51 because the risks of the long-term health consequence of the menopause, osteoporosis, heart disease, and actually for younger women, dementia are greater so it's really important that you stay on the HRT at least until the average age of the menopause. But other than that, I think it's a really personal decision. And then to, to that point, because a lot of, you know, women under 40, it, it is very rare, rare. It's 1%, but it's still, you know, a lot of women when you that is look a lot. at the numbers. Yeah. We have a free questionnaire on our website that can help you figure out if and where you are in the menopause transition as well. So if you know somebody who's wondering if their symptoms are menopause related, the questionnaire might might be able to um, help them as well. And I suppose the other thing I'd say is, Claire, we see a lot uh, and we hear a lot of women saying my symptoms aren't bad enough before I do something about them. And I guess what we say is don't wait till they're really bad. You know, you don't need to wait. You know, once they start impacting your quality of life, that's probably a good time to speak to your doctor about getting the right support and help. Yes. Yeah, no, no. There is no badge of honour in this. And um, just sometimes having a chat about it, you may decide to start it, you may decide to put it on hold. Many women come and have a chat, say, right, OK, that's good. I feel better. I'm going to wait a bit. And then they might come back in a month or two months or a year. Yeah, it's there is no badge of honour. You don't have to wait. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you, and you don't have to suffer in silence, mm. do you? Um couple of quick questions then, Claire, about um, HRT and postmenopausal health. So how does um, HRT help with key conditions that can kick in postmenopause, bone health, heart health, urogenitary syndrome of the menopause? Yeah, so as women go through the menopause, um, our risk, it's really depressing to talk about, our risk of heart disease basically overtakes that of men's below the menopause our risk of heart disease is lower than that of men's. It increases after the menopause. And cardiovascular disease worldwide is the most important cause of mortality for women. So it's really important that we know this so we can tackle it head on. So estrogen is protective on our cardiovascular system. It keeps our good fats high and our bad fats low. It prevents blockages in blood vessels it keeps our blood pressure marginally lower because it keeps our blood vessels nice and springy. So we know that if you start HRT within 10 years of the menopause or under the age of 60, then it definitely benefits in reducing the risk of heart disease. It, it's not going to make the risk go completely away, but it can reduce the risk back down. And there's good data showing reduce the risk of heart disease related deaths sobering to talk about but important that we know about the risk factors for heart disease and we are checking up on our blood pressure cholesterol type 2 diabetes etc in terms of osteoporosis osteoporosis is a disease process where we lose density of our bones and that makes them more prone to fracture makes them more fragile 
And again, bone loss in men and women, de um, sorry, bone density in men and women decreases with age. So bone loss increases with age for men and women. But as we go through the menopause, our female, um, our bone loss accelerates because again, estrogen is important for maintaining bone density. And so if we lose bone density, we're more prone to fractures. Some women will be at high risk, some will be at lower risk, some will have a family history, et cetera. Um, so it's important, again, to have that conversation with somebody if you're worried about osteoporosis, because, again, HRT is a good way of preventing bone loss and actually helping build bone density. Again, that boils down to your risk factors. And then just to touch on genitourinary syndrome with the menopause is vaginal dryness, soreness, irritation, bladder irritability. And that can get worse, if, again, if you don't nip it in the bud with a vaginal estrogen. And we'll talk more about that at our next event. Yeah. Yeah. Super handy little things, vaginal estrogens, and um, can be taken with hrt as well so we're now going to look at the risks and side effects around hrt so claire if you if you could start off by outlining the the key risks around taking hrt and while you're doing that i'm just going to scroll down through the chat because we've had quite a few questions related to risks and in particular side effects of taking hrt yeah absolutely so um, the risks of taking HRT. So there is a really small increased risk of breast cancer diagnosis, and that's not related to dose within standard doses of estrogen. It's related to how long you take HRT for. Um, and it increases risk of um, diagnosis. We think it acts a bit like a promoter. So it increases the chances of being diagnosed with a breast cancer that you may have been programmed to get anyway. And again, sobering to think about, but it doesn't increase your risk of dying from breast cancer um, from the data that we've got. When you stop HRT, the risk slowly decreases back down to population risk. And the length of time it takes to do that is slightly dependent on how long you've been on HRT for. If you swallow estrogen um, in tablet form, if you swallow Premarin, which I've seen a couple of questions about, then it increases the risk of blood clots on legs, lungs, stroke, and it just makes your blood a little bit more sticky. If you have estrogen through the skin, then that doesn't have any impact. Now, Premarin is more likely to make your blood sticky. So if you're at risk of blood clots, it's far safer to have the estrogen through the skin. There's a really tiny risk of gallbladder disease, and that is greater, again, if you swallow estrogen. There is a small risk of diagnosis of ovarian cancer. It's probably a lower risk than breast cancer. And again, it's probably related to how long you take HRT for. But I think it's worth saying that that's based on population observational data sets and no causal link has been proven um, linking HRT and ovarian cancer. Um, so they are the main risks that we speak about in clinic, really. Side effects are different to risks. Um, so side effects um, are the common side effects, headaches, bloating, breast tenderness um, are the most common one, unscheduled bleeding. And of course, as we spoke about earlier, if you take estrogen by itself, there's an increased risk of cancer of the womb lining. But if you take estrogen with a progestogen, then that risk goes away. The only exception is if you start HRT and you're given sequential HRT, where for half of the month you have estrogen and progestogen, for half of the month you have estrogen only, and that gives you a withdrawal bleed. And you would start that type of HRT if you are in the perimenopause still having bleeding. Then if you take that specific type of HRT for more than five years, then again, there is a tiny chance that the risk of cancer of the womb lining can start to creep up. But that's why we switch you after a maximum of five years to continuous combined where you have estrogen every day and a progestogen every day. Bit confusing. We've got information on it on our website. I'm happy to answer questions on that if you need clarification. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. So I'm just going to, um, that was really clear, and I'm just looking through the, um, we've had quite a lot of questions. And so um, can um, HRT cause ovarian cysts? Someone has mentioned that uh, a medic she was seeing um, felt yeah. that. Yeah. It, that it might so so estrogen can stimulate ovaries and there's an association of ovarian cysts with the mirena but they're generally not malignant they're generally not sinister cysts um so it may have been that you've been advised to stop the hrt for a while and they'd rescan you and then it may be that you can restart it if their cysts are related to endometriosis we don't really know if HRT stimulates um, endometriomas or chocolate cysts associated with endometriosis. But if the cysts are just benign, non-suspicious, then that just having an ovarian cyst isn't usually by itself a contraindication to taking HRT. And there are quite good blood tests you can do to make sure that the cyst isn't a sinister or worrying type of cyst. Thank you, Claire. Um, we have quite a few comments and questions around um, related to progesterone sensitivity. Mm. Um, so what advice would you give someone who finds they're very sensitive to the progesterone they're taking and it's impacting their mood in particular? Yeah, th this is an increasing issue as more women take HRT. And a hint that um, you may be sensitive to the progestogens is if you've had particularly bad premenstrual syndrome, or if you've had postnatal depression, for example. And it can be really challenging because you've heard me say that it's important that everybody takes a progestogen alongside their estrogen. So top tips are, there are a number of different types of progestogen that we can take through a number of different routes. So some women really don't feel good when they take eutrogestin, micronized progesterone, if you swallow it. You can off license under the guidance of your doctor, use it vaginally. And we use the same dose vaginally as we do orally. Because it doesn't pass through your stomach, you get different concentration of breakdown products. And so as long as it, you're comfortable using it vaginally and you insert it as high as you can into the vagina, that is an option to discuss with your doctor. Sometimes people don't like progesterone, eutrogestin, but actually they're better with the combined patch. So although it's not body identical progesterone, it's norethisterone, actually they just feel better having the estrogen, the, sorry, the progesterone in the patch. Um, you can off license um, use double dose of the mini pill, but again, only under guidance of your GP. Although if women feel progesterone sensitive, the thought of having a Mirena coil is not particularly appealing. Actually, you only get a tiny, tiny amount of progesterone into your system. And for most women, these will be easy to remove. So having a Mirena alongside some estrogen can be actually really well tolerated. And I always say to women, if I'm fitting a Mirena and they're not 100% sure about it, but they've decided to go for it, if I am physically in the building and they hate it, they can come and I will remove it. And nobody has taken me up on that offer yet. And you can imagine I fit a lot. So um, don't rule out a Mirena in progestogen sensitivity because it can be helpful. And I think we've got information on all of the different types of progestogens in the Knowledge Centre um, GP and patient resources on our website. So you'll see all the different options there. And often it just is working your way through different options to find the right one for you with your doctor. Yeah. That was great, Claire. I think that that's hopefully um, that has helped a lot of people who had variants of questions around progesterone um, sensitivity. Um, there's still qu quite a bit more to get through and, uh, and we're already um, 35 minutes in. The, the, the time is just flying by. Um, one of the questions was around, and, and this segues into dosage I suppose as well quite nicely we've got some questions that I've got some questions that I'm going to put to you around dosage because there's been a lot of media coverage and debate recently about the dosage level of um, estrogen and progesterone um, 
in your experience, Claire, what advice do you give patients and what approach do we take in our clinic and why around dosage? And I suppose some of the questions that we're seeing coming in are around what dose should I start with? Um, and then if I'm not seeing my symptoms improve, how long should I wait before I expect to see an improvement? And when should I think about increasing my yeah. dosage? What advice would you give people on that front there? Yeah. Okay. So um, different doctors practice differently. This is what I do. And this is sort of standard advice. So in the perimenopause, you will have quite a lot of your own estrogen floating around and it's going to go up and down. So at times your estrogen will be low and at times it might even be slightly higher than it was before the menopause transition. And so I generally start with actually a lower dose in the perimenopause and then gradually work up as people transition through because at times your estrogen will be lower, at times it will be higher. You still will get the fluctuations in estrogen with HRT that can trigger symptoms. So I think you're better starting low and then see how you go. Um, so and if you are starting HRT in the menopause, it sort of depends. So that's periods of stop for a year or more. Um, then it sort of depends a bit on how bad your symptoms are. So a standard dose would be um, two pumps of gel or a 50 microgram patch or one milligram of Sandrina or two to three sprays of Lenzetto. So I may start the lower dose in the perimenopause, so a 25 microgram patch, one pump of gel, one to two sprays of this, and then um, in the menopause, start a standard dose of estrogen. The rule of thumb is you want to wait around three months before you increase the dose, um, because it really can take that length of time to settle. Now, if you're really struggling, nobody is going to make you suffer through three months. But sometimes I hear women have um, been on social, um, maybe on uh, social media, and they've just really ramped up that estrogel. They've gone very quickly from two to four pump measures because they don't feel better. And the issue with that is actually, if you go up really quickly, you can downregulate your estrogen receptors, which means basically that the estrogen can become less effective. And if you go really high in the perimenopause, it doesn't leave you anywhere then to go necessarily when you go through into the menopause where you might need more estrogen. In If you're starting HRT later on in life, so um, say some women wait until their 60s and they just get completely fed up and then come and have a chat about it, then again, you probably need less estrogen to manage your symptoms in your 60s. And so, again, you may then start on a lower dose of estrogen. Oh, so hopefully, the, in summary, perimenopause, usually better to start lower, accept you're going to have some fluctuation, but on the whole, you'll feel better. In the menopause, depending on symptoms, you might start a standard dose and starting later in life, a lower dose and waiting, if you can, two to three months before you increase the dose is usually the best plan. And in terms of going above standard doses, we do this occasionally if we've got evidence that women aren't absorbing it through the skin very well. And when we go above standard doses, when we go to high doses of estrogen, it's really important we make sure that there is adequate, adequate progestogen as well. Because the more estrogen you take, the more um, likely you are to thicken the womb lining. And so that's why as you move up to a hundred patch, for example, your doctor may say, right, instead of one eutrogestin every night, take two eutrogestin every night. I saw a question about, um, is the Mirena enough with two to three pumps of gel? We think the Mirena is enough up to four pumps of gel but actually we've got very little data to show it, but we, we are assuming that the Mirena, because we know it's effective, is fine. And we just don't know beyond that. So again, it was a long answer, but hopefully that covered the spots. Yeah, no, um, Carrie, I think that was, I think you've explained that wonderfully. It was, it's really, really clear. And 
I think a lot of the related questions in this area are around knowing whether or not you should increase your dosage because your symptoms haven't improved, how long should you wait? So I think you've addressed that. And then also, if you do increase your dosage, it's almost like, is there a trigger point at which you need to add more progesterone then if you go beyond? So if you go from two pumps yeah. to three pumps, do you need to add more progesterone or is it three pumps to four pumps? Is there, is there a rule of thumb for that? Yeah, I know that's a really good question. And there's a really brilliant but long guidance that's recently put, been published by the British Menopause Society on this and to answer one of the questions that's just come in so let's just start from the beginning so a low dose of estrogen is one pump of gel 25 microgram patch one to two sprays of Lenzetto a stan and a standard dose two pumps of gel 50 microgram patch around three sprays of Lenzetto moderately increased dose, three pumps of gel, 75 microgram patch. Um, Lenzetto stops at three sprays with a standard dose. And you can use standard doses of progesterone up to that point, unless, well, we won't talk about unless for now. And then when you get to a hundred microgram patch, four pumps of gel, or two milligrams of Sandrina, that's when you need to increase the progestogen if you're taking eutrogestin. And that means that if you are on 100 every night, you go to 200 every night. If you are taking two progesterone for 12 nights of every calendar month, you would be advised to go to three. This is off license. We have no data to inform us as to whether that does anything to the risk of breast cancer, but we know that that's going to be a more effective way of keeping the womb lining thin, hence the juggling of pros and cons. If you have a lot of risk factors for thickening of the womb lining, so for example, if your body mass index is 40, 35 to 40 or more, then actually we might increase the progesterone at a lower dose, but that sort of a discussion to be had. So hopefully yeah. that clarifies that. But that guidance is excellent if you want to see it in black and white. Yeah, well, let's get the link out to that, Claire, I think. Um, look, I think the key thing that you've called out is um, you do need to be really mindful of the dosage of both. And if you are going to change the dosage, your recommendation to speak to your GP or healthcare practitioner in doing so to make sure that you're 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 keeping yourself safe, I suppose, really, isn't it? And you're doing this safely. Yes, no, absolutely. So I'm just posting that um link there. Yeah, no, no. So just with advice of your doctor or other healthcare professional, basically, is what you need to do. Don't increase doses of estrogen yourself. Talk to a healthcare professional. Don't feel that you don't feel pressure to increase the progesterone yourself talk to your healthcare professional. Yep. And then before we move on to, uh, you've already um, given us a sneak preview of what some of the different types of uh, estrogens look like. Uh, but before we do, there's a really great question that's very related to this conversation that we're having now. Um, how would I know if I'm taking too much estrogen? Are there particular symptoms that manifest that I can see and that will tell me? Yes, so you might have unscheduled bleeding um breast tenderness is common some women feel more anxious with high doses of estrogen some women don't sleep and feel, say that they feel a little bit wired um, and actually with really high doses of estrogen and this is usually above standard doses you can have hot flushes it's um there's something called tachyphylaxis where, where if you're taking a very high dose of estrogen it can actually it's not effective and you can have hot flushes and it's really, you, we really have to slowly bring the dose down. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. So we've covered an awful lot of ground there and an awful lot of questions. And I think that was really clear. Now, in addition to looking at estrogen and progesterone, there are many different ways that you can take estrogen in particular. So we've got about, we've only got about 13 minutes left here. I wonder if we could if you could very quickly just take us through the, 
the main ways of taking them um, and the key differences. And I suppose how you, how you, you know, when somebody comes to see you, how you help them decide which version is best for them, a spray, a patch, a gel, and so on. Mm. Um, and then I think mm. our next event is on testosterone and vaginal estrogens. We might pick up on some of the things that we didn't get to cover this evening at that as well. Mm. Absolutely. Right. So when deciding what type of estrogen or what type of HRT you'd like to take, um, there are a few practical considerations. So let's start with gel. So gel comes in a pump dispenser or a little sachet is Sandrina. Gel takes a good five minutes to dry, as anybody using gel will tell you. Now, that might not be an issue for you. If you're really busy, as I am often in the morning, that is an issue. And you also you can put it on at bedtime, but it also needs to stay dry for at least two hours. So if you're somebody who likes swimming um, or you shower a lot, again, that needs to be taken into account of. When you are applying gel, you squeeze the pump dispenser all the way down. You get a dollop of gel in your hands. That's one pump measure. And um, you basically rub it up and down. It says in the patient's information, a large area. If you look at the diagram, it's basically all the way down the back of your arm so it doesn't touch your breast. Um, you don't need to be trying to rub it in. It will not rub in like a nice body cream up and down a couple of times and then just allow it to dry. Um, and it, you really do need to wait till it's completely dry to cover it because if you cover it when it's still a bit tacky, you do remove a fair percentage of it. Um, the rules with Sandrina are very slightly different. I think it tells you just to put it over your shoulder. You can use your inner thigh for both also. Um, in terms of patches, so um, patches go below the waist, hair-free skin on a non-bendy bit of body. So either right at the top of your thigh or your buttock. You can put it on your lower tummy, but it can be a bit prickly and uncomfortable. And you change these twice weekly. So they stay on all the time and you have one on for three days, one on for four days. So it's always the same day of the week to make it easier to remember. Um, there are weekly patches as well. I don't prescribe them very often because I find many women tell me they fall off, but there is a weekly patch also. You then unpeel it and then stick another one on the other side or another place to where you put the first one. They can leave an adhesive residue, which is a pain. You can get bobbly bits of your black opaque tights. But actually, there are products now that you can buy that um, help you wipe away. Or some women tell me they use baby oil. People have all sorts of different ways to remove the adhesive. They do stick while you're swimming. Usually they do usually stick while you're exercising, running, wearing Lycra. Um, occasionally they don't stick. And that just is, if they don't stick, they don't stick. And it's your skin type. And occasionally women get um, irritated by the adhesive. You can try changing the brand. But again, that might be then. So if you know that you're a really allergic -y type of sensitive skin person, you might be better with gel or spray. Um, so that is a good option if you don't want the faff of applying something every day. Um, Sorry, can I just say yeah. I found I switched from gel to patch and it was a revelation once I put it on my butt because there's no yeah. fluffy bits and it was super okay. easy. So your advice and that was great, but it meant such a difference. Totally. And actually, there is some evidence to show you maybe absorb a bit better from your buttock than your tummy. So, yeah. Some people stick them on their arms. Don't stick them on your arms. Um, then there is spray, which is Lenzetto which is great actually. So spray is good if you want to use something every day, which some people do, and you spray it on your forearm, you press it down, that's one squeeze measure, and spray is a thin liquid that takes more like a couple of minutes to dry. Spray is good because you probably get more of an even spread of estrogen over 24 hours because of how it sits, underneath, um, sits beneath the skin. 
If you want to start a really low dose of estrogen, the spray is good because one spray of Lanzetto is equivalent to less than one pump of gel or the lowest dose patch. Um, and if you use more than one spray, it's one, two, three. I should have said if you're using one pump, more than one pump of gel, you need to put each pump in a different location. So one pump, back of one arm, one pump, back of the other arm. The literature in the pump um, information does say if you're using four pumps, you can use two pumps in one location. So you can try that. Sometimes if um, I'll say use um, four different locations for better absorption, it sort of depends on how you're going with it, but read the leaflet. And the final thing to say is with, particularly with gel and spray, just make sure that you're not then rubbing against somebody because this is designed to um, go through the skin. So there is a risk that you can transfer the estrogen to somebody else. It's why you need to wash your hands as well after. And for a link to that, um, we've got a great question here. Um, what is close contact after applying gel? Um, so it's within two hours and it's basically rubbing, it's rubbing against. So if you put it on at night and then you sleep against your partner, you could potentially rub it from your skin to them. Very clear, thank you. So um, that was oestrogen. Um, anything quickly, I think we've covered uh, progesterone because we've spoken about tablets, we've spoken about the marina coil, then you've got patches with oestrogen. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, there's a combined patch that contains oestrogen and progestogen, Everal Conti and Everal Sequi. Somebody's asked a question about cutting patches, cutting Everal Sequi. I wouldn't cut up the combined patches without advice from your doctor because we have to assume that you still get the same amount of progesterone you know that you get enough progesterone and we just don't know the answers so occasionally it happens but it's not a straightforward thing to do to the person who asked that question you're better off changing the hrt than chopping the patches with the combined patches several sequi and several conti yeah, brilliant. Um, that was really clear. And then a really interesting question here. I think this is the first time we've had it. So um, uh, great question from Louisa. Uh, has a quite a large birthmark on her thigh. Should she avoid that area when applying the gel? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the honest answer is I haven't been asked that before. Certainly, if you've got a big birthmark, the junctions in the skin might be different. It might affect absorption. I think we don't really, estrogen does ha ha play an active part in the skin. So for example, some there are estrogen receptors on some types of melanoma. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have HRT if you've had a melanoma, but it does need a discussion. I think I would say avoid it just because I can't show you a paper that says it's fine and it won't be affected um, by the birthmark and vice versa. So great question. Thank you. Um, but yeah, if you were, if you really wanted to use the estrogen over that area, I'd maybe even have a chat with a dermatologist because it's an unusual situation. Certainly yeah. you don't see any skin changes where you use the gel. Um, but yeah, good question. And to, then some of the other questions that we uh, didn't cover, I'm just going to circle back to a few before we uh, wrap up. Um, a really great question from somebody who's 67 and she wants to know is it too late for her to start hrt and have the benefits around osteoporosis cholesterol and so on so heart health and so on yeah no no so that is a good question so it's not too late in terms of protective effects on your bones but you probably won't get any benefit to cardiovascular disease risk from the data that we've got to date so yes to bones, no increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but no protective effects. Thank you. And again, link to that. And I, I think you've, you've covered it, but I think it's really good to crystallize it. Um, the great question from someone asking if they can take HRT when they're five years post-menopause, so they're 56, so went through the menopause at 51. Can they now start with HRT? 
Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's really interesting to know that when your periods have stopped, your own estrogen, although it, it won't be measurable because how we measure estrogen isn't sensitive enough, but your own estrogen does continue to decrease. And so some women actually are fine for a year or two after their periods have stopped because they don't need everybody's so different is so different in how sensitive they are to hormones and hormone levels um that sometimes you don't get symptoms till after the menopause it's not usual but it sometimes does happen so you can absolutely start hrt five years from your last menstrual period and you will get the benefit to your heart and you will get the benefit to your bones thank you claire and the last question is an um from a woman in the group who is 78, nearly 78. She's still on HRT and she feels really well. It's really helping with well, her symptoms. Um, and she's just wondering if she should be worried about getting repeat prescriptions from her H for HRT from her doctor without any questions asked. Um, it depends on your GP. Um, sometimes I get women in their 70s referred to my specialist clinic because the GP is a bit nervous. And we have a chat and say, right, are you on the safest type of HRT for you? You probably only need a low dose. It's really important you have the estrogen through the skin because your risk of blood clots and stroke increase with age. Um, but as long as you understand the benefits and as long as you understand the risks that your age related risk of breast cancer goes up with age also and is related to how long you've been on HRT for, you know, as long as you have that discussion, I would say jolly good, crack on. There are lots of benefits. The issue is we haven't got studies on older women or women with more years, I should say, to know what the risk benefit ratios look like. But look, it's I think it's a really personal decision. Just get the right safe advice. And if your GP refuses to prescribe it, then just you know say well I'd really like to carry on taking it. Can you refer me to somebody to have another discussion? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Claire. And I'm going to sneak in one last last question. I promise. Um, can you use just progesterone and not estrogen? Um, it, it, you probably wouldn't really want to. More people are starting to ask about this, and you know some people do feel good with progesterone. In the olden days, progesterone was sometimes used in that way, but in generally you won't get the benefits that you get from taking estrogen so i'd question why do you want to actually most yeah, i'd spend more time trying to find a progesterone that people tolerate um and progesterone isn't licensed to be taken just by itself it can be good for managing bleeding progesterone only pill is good for managing bleeding but if we're thinking specifically menopause symptoms here not managing gynecological conditions, not managing endometriosis. If we're talking just menopause, you probably wouldn't want to just take progesterone. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thank yeah. you, Claire. So look, um, we'll wrap it off at that. I think we got to most questions, possibly not all. I should say, and Emma, maybe you could put in the link. We have a Facebook group that you can join for free. And every Tuesday, we have a half hour doctor drop in where you can put your questions to the doctor. Um, you can send your questions in in advance and catch up with the video and watch it later. It's all free. Um, you could equally book an appointment to see Dr. Claire, one of the other doctors in our clinic. Um, or if you sign up to our, our newsletter, you, we regularly send out updates about events, but also about uh, latest recommendations and guidance on treatment. Um, so a big thank you to you all for joining us this evening. It's been so much participation and really fantastic questions. A huge thank you to Emma for her busy posting and hopefully you found all those links that she's put into the chat helpful and huge thanks to Dr. Claire for sharing all of her expertise and her insights uh, with us this evening in plain language. It was super helpful, Claire. Thank you very much. So thank you, everyone. Hopefully we'll see you at our next event. We'll close out on some of the things that we didn't get to this evening but we'll really do a deep dive on testosterone and vaginal estrogens. And as I said, in November, we'll look at alternatives to HRT, both prescribable and terrible. So thank you very much. Hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming. Bye.